You know what I think is cool? Color terms. They're cool. They're strange. They might even feel self-evident and universal. But colors have a lot of interesting nonsense going for them. If you only speak English, you may have never encountered this. But not every language has the same color terms. Maybe you've heard, as I did when I was young, that the ancient Greeks were colorblind, as can be seen in the way Homer describes water as being the color of wine. This isn't true, but what is true is that some languages definitely have more color terms, and some definitely have less. And, for some reason, every language is at least a of them. But what is a color? Physicists may tell you that a color is just how we perceive a specific wavelength of light. And that, to me, sounds like witchcraft. Artists may tell you that a color is any combination of some core set of pigments, depending on if you're adding them or subtracting them. But when last I checked, these two colors looked different to me. Explain that, artists. But what do linguists say color is? Well, unfortunately, we only answer important questions. And such a simple and self-evident one isn't really worth my time to answer. Which is why it has been left as an exercise to the viewer. Please, in the comments below, tell me what you believe a color to be. And remember, this will count towards your final grade. That said, linguists do care to answer what a color term is. Color terms, not to be confused with colors, are basic and common words that describe a whole category of colors. In order for something to be a basic color term and not just a color, it needs to meet three requirements. The first is that it must be monomorphemic. That is, it can't be made up of separable parts with distinct meanings, so no light blues or yellow greens. The second is that it must be dominant. That is, it may not be able to be described as either a shade of another color or a comparison to another thing. So no ashes, no azures, and no air superiority blues. And finally, it must be common. That is, most people have to know what color you're talking about. So no hex codes and no colors out of space. It is very easy to make it to adulthood without knowing that chartreuse is green and not pink. So while it is a color, it's not a basic color term. I bring this up because it's useful to understand what is and isn't technically a color term when comparing languages. Russian has more basic colors than English, which has more basic colors than Piraha. But I digress. The origins of color as a concept do not simply go back to the beginning of time. They simply couldn't. There was, necessarily, a time before humans were there to think about color. And even after they were there, they didn't necessarily think of the colors we think about today. Indeed, most living humans probably don't think about color the way you do. But we'll put a pin in that. The linguists Brent Berlin and Paul Kay proposed in 1969 that all languages start historically with two color terms, black and white. If you've seen something about this before, you may think that those are the specific colors. But black and white here don't mean the colors as you might think of them. Rather, they are two bundles of colors. Those being warm, bright colors and dark, cool colors. Berlin and Kay then suggested that languages develop color terms for various hues over time and as they need them, starting with red and progressing down the line until they have six colors, black, white, red, green, blue, and yellow. This theory isn't perfect, languages occasionally buck this trend, but it does seem true that languages generally get more color terms over time rather than fewer, as anyone who's familiar with ancient Greek can attest. One particularly interesting fact seems to be that the only modern color term in Indo-European languages that has meant the same thing since Proto-Indo-European is red, reud, or something to that effect, meaning red or ruddy, all other terms are either unclear or derived from roots meaning burning, glowing, bright, or white. This includes black. Compare red with blue, which started out as the Proto-Indo-European word bell, or something to that effect, meaning something along the lines of light-colored, and is the origin of the Latin flaus, meaning yellow, the Greek palos, meaning white, and the Welsh blaur, meaning gray. By the way, best word for gray Ever. So what is this pattern and how do languages go through it? Ah, finally. A question truly worth my time. Well, languages typically develop terms for the six colors I mentioned earlier. We sometimes call these the primary colors, and they develop in a series of stages from one to five. Now, assuming our hypothetical language starts with just two colors, dark and light, 
it should quickly get a word for red in stage two. That may mean just red, or it might mean red through to yellow, which we call rello. Most of the time, it's the latter. After that, in stage three, green and blue typically split from black, producing a color called gru. In stage four, red and yellow split, though orange is still far from developing. Of the languages surveyed in the World Atlas of Language Structures, most languages with six or fewer color terms are at this stage. Next comes stage five, where GRU splits into green and blue, giving us a total of six basic color terms. This process does occasionally go differently. If, in stage three, the language winds up with RELO splitting into red and yellow before GRU splits from black, then stage four can occasionally involve green splitting from black without blue, leaving behind a term for black and blue, but not green. This would mean that black wouldn't split from blue until stage five. In some rare cases, languages develop into stage three with a term for red, white, and black, alongside a joint color for yellow, green, and blue. If this happens, then stage four might wind up with blue splitting from yellow instead of from black. However, in some cases, blue might actually split from yellow-green, which will then split in stage five. This second set of outcomes, however, does seem unusual, and as best I can tell, it only shows up in a handful of languages. After the primary colors, things get a bit freer. First, languages tend to get brown, which is classed as stage six. And shortly after that, stage seven is where the hierarchy falls apart. Here, they develop terms for pink, purple, gray, and orange, which is particularly funny given that brown is just a shade of orange, but darker. Finally, a bit beyond that, you'll start seeing blue split into two colors, like happened in Russian and Italian. So, were the ancient Greeks colorblind? Well, clearly not. And before anyone suggests it, they also weren't bound by their language to be unable to see the difference between the colors of wine and the sea. Different languages split the world into different categories in different ways, just because the way your language cuts up the world makes sense to you doesn't mean it'll make sense to everyone, or that that's the only reasonable way to do so. Some languages care more for minute differences in things you would likely find baffling, while others care little for big differences that must seem entirely self-evident to you. It doesn't mean you can't talk about these concepts or differences, just that they don't prioritize them. To paraphrase the linguist Roman Jakobson, languages differ not in what they can say, but in what they must say. And I think that's cool. <laughs>